welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this fourth session of the Future Scientist. I'm James C. Barbieri, Associate Program Director here at the Power Centre, and I'm also joined by Eleanor Pete, President of the Power Centre, and we will be your hosts for today. As hosts, we're here to help you throughout the call. So any problems, technical or not, feel free to just drop us a message in the chat. Today, uh, we have Dr. Alex gomez Marin who will be joined in conversation with a very special guest, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Dr. Shiva is an Indian scholar, activist, and author who has a PhD in physics, but is also a food sovereignty advocate, environmentalist, and eco-feminist. She has written more than 20 books and has written as a consultant for the Indian government, at home and abroad, and in NGOs. Dr. Shiva has received numerous international honors, such as the John Lennon Yoko Ono Grant for Peace, Sydney's Peace Prize, Calgary's Peace Prize, and the Right Livelihood Award, which is regarded as the Alternative Nobel Prize. It's a great pleasure to have you today, uh, Dr. Shiva. Thank um, you. And today we also welcome back our resident conversationalist, Dr. Alex Gomez Marin. Alex is a uh, Spanish theoretical physicist turned neuroscientist. Since 2016, he has been the head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory at the Instituto de Neurociencias in Alicante, Spain, where he is an associate professor of the Spanish, Spanish Research Council. Combining high resolution behavior experiments, computational and theoretical biology and continental philosophy, his latest research concentrates on real life cognition and consciousness. Welcome back, Alex. Um, Thank you, James. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone of a couple of guidelines for this session, um, as we may have a few newcomers. Uh, first of all, if you can please mute your microphone during the presentations and Q&A, just to ensure good quality out audio. But at the same time, please do turn on your camera as we believe it creates a nice educational environment. Now, if it makes you feel more comfortable, feel free to just keep your camera off. Uh, throughout the call, please do use the chat. It's a great way to share your ideas with the group. Um, and also during the Q and A discussion, if you want to have, a, if you would like to ask a question, you can either use the raise your hand function or physically raise your hand, and we'll call out your name to ask your question. Um, at the same time, though, Sex, sorry. If you're comfortable, you can use the chat to ask your question, and we can read it out for you. Uh, finally, this session is recorded for archival purposes and for you all. The recording should be available um, in a few days' time, and you should all receive the link to this. And with that, I'll pass it over to our guests today. Welcome, Alex and Dr. Shiva. Thank you so Thank you. much, James and the Paris Center, again, for hosting and making this series possible. And I'm really honored today to have Bandana with us and really honored that you accepted our invitation. And beyond your impressive track record uh, and spectacular CV, um, it, you're the first scientist who is a woman and a non-Westerner in this conversation series. Um, we announce every month the following, the following person that's gonna, that we're gonna have here with us, but I think it's important to remark that. And, also, it's important to put it in context of what we've been discussing previously and what will be most surely special and particular about today is that we've been discussing before scientific ideas, of course, philosophical aspects and methods of inquiry, and also those science and philosophy in context, right? So we've talked a bit about the political and, and sociological context, but most of our discussions so far perhaps have been constrained or confined to laboratories and, and seminar rooms, you could say. And now having you here, it's it immediately just it explodes this space into the real world and of science as a human practice with its hardcore political implications and, and societal responsibilities. So I wanted, to, I wanted to start this conversation by drawing, a, offering to you a, an analogy or maybe a homology that has to do with real world activism because you're so well known for resisting the effects of globalization of the food chain. And we can talk about that, of course, about food and seeds and soil. I wanted to draw this um, analogy between the effects of globalization on food chain towards the effect of globalization of the thought chain uh, in science. I'm sure there, there are parallels there and perhaps we could start with that. Yeah, I, I think the 
the phenomena of corporate globalization really grew from a particular kind of mind. Um, you know, it's definitely a mechanical mind that does not see living systems. It was in fact the entire Baconian project of uh, a masculine birth of time and um, a science that would subjugate nature and turn her into a slave. It was basically to say there's nothing like life out there. You know, Descartes' work, it's, it's, it's all a machine. So it's just extension and mass. And so we are stuck with 400 years of, of the shaping of a mind that does not see life and, and is in denial of life. And, uh, and globalization at one level was taking that to its extreme. Because why did I get involved in globalization? You know, as, you, as was mentioned, you know, I've, I've done my work in physics and you know, I've got behind me the sculpture of Einstein who been the, the inspiration. You know, I grew up in the forests of the Himalaya. I grew up in convents which didn't teach physics. And it was little, little writings of Einstein that taught me that, you know, here's a way you can connect inquiry of how the world works with social responsibility. And that's the kind of life I wanted to do. I ended up looking at agriculture because of what happened to the state where I had done my MSc honors in physics, the state of Punjab, the most prosperous part of India. And it had been ruined by something that was called the green revolution, not green, not revolutionary, basically selling chemicals, leftover war chemicals after the wars had ended and then creating a whole uh, structure to justify that the soil is empty. The plants are merely machines. And uh, when I did the study for the United Nations University, I read every textbook that's taught in agriculture to understand why are they doing what they're doing you know, to this prosperous land and have they ruined it? They've destroyed the waters. There's a cancer train that leaves that place. So I studied what agriculture was. And then when globalization came and the World Trade Organization and the GATT, I realized there were three agreements that were being added to the trade system uh, that weren't there before. One was intellectual property that now onwards we will pretend that we invent living organisms and they are machines. And therefore they can be patented like machines can be patented. And I said, no, seeds and biodiversity are self-organized living systems and evolution. And so I started to follow the intellectual property issue, agreement of agriculture written by Cargill. And I said, if they've already made such a mess with the green revolution, what's going to happen? If four companies control all the trade in food, four or five companies control all the seed and the chemicals, and four or five control the transformation of good healthy food into junk, because that's what the food processing industry. So there was an intellectual property agreement, there was an agriculture agreement run by Gargill and a sanitary and phytosanitary agreement, really which is a junk food agreement. And, uh, and countries like Spain, countries like Italy are hugely threatened by this because it, it, it creates an equivalence of bad food with good. It creates an equivalence of fake ingredients and pure ingredients. And that makes all the difference to health. So I started to you know, both study globalization. I, I read every law. I understood the TRIPS agreement, the agriculture agreement, very sad. I mean, the agriculture agreement has not a word on farmers or soil or anything. And, uh, and I realized this was the, the greed machine with its profit orientation working mechanically as if food was just a commodity to be put into container ships and moved around and sold, you know, bought sheep and sold deer. And, uh, and then every time there was a crisis, the, the Russian sanctions of 70s or today the Ukraine-Russia war, that, you know, the whole system then works to maximize profits, the deep data is there. But the globalized system is making a feast out of the, made a feast out of the COVID crisis and now out of the Ukraine war. 
Um, meantime, people are not able to afford food. Yeah. So it is a certain kind of mind and it has just two parameters. Yeah. One axis is greed, profits at any cost. The other axis is me mechanical objects in an absolutely non-living world. So this initial philosophical program, right, of mechanistic science and philosophy, reductionism and materialism grew into science, but then you're saying that it's when it went into the political sphere um, through globalism, globalization, that's when it went really mad and in a way, I was going to say unstoppable, but I won't say that because you're resisting it, right? So is the is this um, kind of a as kind of a metastasis of some some philosophical ideas from philosophy to science to the world? Is this to be fought in the political in the political in, on political grounds today, or is there work that scientists can do, or is it so global and and in this other level that really the the, the battle needs to be fought at the political level? You know, I think the the reduction of knowledges or uh, knowledge democracies to just one form, you know, the mechanistic reductionist materialist form, uh, that was a political project. You know, it would be wrong mm -hmm. to isolate it from the powers of that time. After all, Bacon was the chancellor. He was in charge of the witch hunts. Mm -hmm. He was torturing mm -hmm. people. And therefore he thought torturing was a good methodology for inquiry into the world. But we shouldn't forget that a little before that, there had been a papal bull that had uh, basically unleashed the inquisition and the witch hunts, nine million people were killed. And that to me is a knowledge issue. It's what would be allowed as knowledge and what would not be allowed as knowledge. What would be counted as heresy? and what would be counted as knowledge. So we already saw 9 million, it would be lovely history. I did see that in Spain, they're having amazing ceremonies of forgiveness to the, you know, apologies to the witches. We ask for forgiveness that you were burned on a stake for mm. going, being an expert of mm. a different kind, you know? Mm. But I would say the healing kind, you know? Because who were the people who were killed? People who were healing society. And, uh, and, you know, when you, when you think of what humans can do to themselves, that's when you kind of understood it in history, you realize that what humans are doing to themselves today is actually repeating some of the errors that have been historically performed. And we'll have to learn some of the corrections also, you know, from history. So I don't see a neat line between a dominant science, which is not about inquiry and politics. Because that dominant science is politics. Mm. It's about the power of the individuals engaged in it, not about the epistemic quality of their engagement. That's very interesting. Thank you for bringing them both together. So then let's talk about three levels that I think are interesting because you've done a lot of work at the level of the individual and you could you could say honor, I'm going to say honor the feminine aspect, also at the level of communities, which could be honor the land and at the level of the earth, which would be nature, right? So there are these three levels playing simultaneously as if it was a music score where this um, knowledge issue is at stake. So could you tell us a bit more about these three, again, from your work as an activist regarding food and so on? And again, let's try to draw the immediate parallel to scientific research. Yeah, I, I think it's extremely important for, you know, for people to understand how did I approach this phenomena that was taking place in Punjab called the Green Revolution. I didn't have any background in agriculture, but I did have my PhD on non-locality in quantum theory. And the uniqueness of, of quantum thought in, in, in my view, and that's why I went deep into it and that's the thinking that I carry with me in every aspect of any field I go into, first is non-separation, yeah? Non-locality, non-separation. The mechanistic world was about separation. Second, it is about no fixed qualities, you know? It's all in the making, yeah? Mm. It's 
that, that's where Bohm's implicate order, you know, the enfoldment, all of those qualities come into it. Um, potential and vital. And, and because it's about potential and nothing is fixed, they cannot have the arrogance of certainty. You have to have the humility of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And because you have the humility of uncertainty, you have the compassion of difference. Yeah, you don't have the excluded middle. So those are four, you know, they're, they're both basic principles of how the world functions, but they are principles that can teach us about consciousness, the principles of, of relatedness, and, and every aspect of my work, because, you know, why, why have I entered fields that weren't my background, yeah? Why did I look at forestry when the women came out to hug the trees in Chippewa? So I started to, I knew the forest, I'd grown up in them, and I'd studied in a deep way the ecology of the forest. And so I wrote a lot, I did a lot of books. Uh, agriculture, I told you about the bloodshed in the state where I had worked. So I applied that mind of what's the context? What is making this happen? So I tried to create the context. And therefore the book I wrote on the Green Revolution was called The Violence of the Green Revolution in terms of how the Green Revolution creates a context for certain potential to unfold. Mm. Um, it's, it's the same with my work on, um, you know, having studied on agriculture and the Green Revolution, I took that and expanded it when I was at a meeting and, you know, the old chemical companies were saying, we'll now have patents of seed and we will do genetic engineering. I started to apply everything that my knowledge had taught me, both from the world of quantum theory, as well as the world of understanding agriculture. I started to understand that basically genetic engineering was taking the mechanistic assumptions to the genetic level with total irresponsibility. And so I started to say, but you have to know what you're doing. And I started to articulate the term of biosafety. And then the United Nations appointed me to the expert group to frame a biosafety protocol of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Article 19.3 of that convention, I was there in Rio just telling the governments that things will happen and you'd better know what will happen. And that discipline of science is called biosafety today. And we have a protocol, international protocol. And, um, and the final agreement of that was made in a meeting in Madrid. I have also learned in the process, you know, as long as you study physics, you, you, you do your equation. You know, I love physics because it meant I could hide in my equations. But then you also want to understand the world. But the minute I got involved with Chipko, I got involved with the agriculture, my teacher shifted, you know? My teacher was not my mind alone anymore, you know? It, it had, it, my, my teachers became the peasants who were practicing farming. Mm. And then over the last 40 years, having done this work and saved seeds, my teachers became the seed. My teachers became, I mean, I get fascinated with plants, you know? Uh, just with the intelligence, the fact that they're adapting at every minute. We do a lot of work on climate adaptation, but we do it by observing with deep relationship mm -hmm. the plants we work with. And, uh, and it, it becomes a much richer world than, you know, an impoverished world of reading outmoded texts of arrogant men who rule the world in their time and are ruining the world 400 years later. So we do need a fresh thinking and we do need a fresh approach to science and science means to know. So we need to tap every place where knowledge is mm. and allow that to flow into the shaping of the future. And as you're talking about the farmers, I, I think of this expression in English, skin in the game. And I realize how little we often have as academics, uh, scientists, right? Because sure, we can do our experiments in the lab, by the way, most of the time, they may, not, may or may not work. And sure, we can have more or less success. But at the end of the day, nothing compared to trying to grow your own food and really going through all the many things that go, can go wrong. And you really want to make these things work and, and, and function, right? So there's a, a huge imbalance, I would say, into the kinds of skin in the game scientists or politicians have and then when you talk about farmers which when Im that immediately you know grounds it also realizing that that the methods we use in statistics for instance as i understand were derived from agriculture because you wanted to 
properly measure what's going on. So there's a potential transfer here again. I'm trying to build a bridge um, between what, what we could uh, as scientists learn from farmers with respect to the ecology and also the skin in the game. Or in, in other words, how can we make scientists and politicians, as you were saying before, it feels like we're causing all this trouble, but we are not feeling it. I like to think of organisms as cybernetic um, as well. So it's like we're doing things, uh, but the things we're doing, we're also perceiving them in a loop, but it's probably because we're not perceiving the consequences of what we're doing. Somehow we're ignoring it, that we continue doing what we do, despite it's not just beneficial, it's not, not just, um, um, even if it's a benefit for us, it ends up being destroying the world and also it destroys the very powerful people. So uh, of course, you've, you may have thought about ways of including that loop in their minds so that they realize that what they're doing is also causing trouble in their own, in their own world. Well, you know, it's quite simple. It's taking the system into account, the system as a whole, not its fragment, yeah? because the, you know, reductionism, uh, mechanistic reductionism takes a whole and reduces it to a part and says, this is it, you know? And this is the part that's interesting to me because I can extract it and make profits out of it. Mm. And, you know, when I was working on the forestry question, it was unbelievable, the literature, that in this rich rainforest with 5,000 species, the rest are clearly weeds because there's only one we can exploit commercially. So mm. there was this constant sort of, viewing from the market, from profits, that shrunk the, the landscape, you know, and didn't allow you to see it. And that's why I wrote a book called Monocultures of the Mind. I said, what is it that al doesn't allow people to see the richness of the biodiversity of trees, doesn't allow them to see the biodiversity of crops? The Green Revolution was rice and wheat in India. And, you know, we see 10,000 varieties and we've saved, we've saved 4,000 rice varieties, We've saved, um, I think, more than two, 500 wheat varieties, every kind of bean that was forgotten. The Britishers didn't even know that beans are nitrogen fixing crops, you know, and mm. uh, they were having big debates at the time when the peasants of India knew these are nitrogen fixing crops. So I think the first thing about, about those in decision making uh, uh, and relating to agriculture is to recognize farmers as scientists, you yeah? know, Everything I've done on the seed, it's from farmers I've learned about seed because the assumption of the industrial agriculture, the green revolution is farmers don't breed. Yeah, mm. Even the vocabulary is, it's a land race. Yeah, It pops up from the ground without any work, you know, any relationship. But how could a grass or rice of sativa have been evolved into 200,000 varieties of rice? How could one plant eosinte have been turned into the thousands of variety of corn? That was a breeding exercise. It was a scientific exercise. Mm. And having worked now for so long in this field, for me, it has been very inspiring to see systems that with a bias you will call a cultural festival are actually seed germination tests. Yeah? The nine crops are brought. And, and then there's a ceremony, but what they're really testing is the nine days of germination and deciding which seed is good and what, what should be extinct. So there isn't this rupture between culture and knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. the two weave into each other. So number one, scientists are experts. And in a field of growing food, they've done it longer and they do it in every kind of way. The so-called scientists one guy might be an entomologist, but he knows more, more about what pesticide to spray than the insect diversity. Mm. That's why insects are disappearing. A soil scientist, and I, when I did my book, I talked to so many of them. Most of them know how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium to spray, yeah, urea to put. They don't know the soil organism. That's a new breed of scientists who are growing. And most of those scientists, whether it be in seed, or it be in biodiversity of soil or biodiversity of insects, they're all evolving their knowledge in a participatory way, a deep participation with both the soil, the farmer and the scientist, mm. yeah? So it is a dialogue. It's much more of a dialogue and a participation than uh, the 
you know, the, the false idea that here's an inert object, you know, and I'm the Mr. Noah. Yeah? There are no inert objects in a living world. It's a simple principle. In a living well, world, everything's living. Well, the, the very idea of a laboratory, which is, of course, made so as you can control the conditions, would not be, would not, should not be evil by construction. But of course, the moment you, especially when you study living, living organisms, as I discussed with my neuroscientist colleagues, well, we, we treat them as objects because that's more convenient for us to study, to study them. And also we remove the context. And so we do this in laboratories, or you could be doing um, calculations in computer code or in whiteboards. But then the moment you go to the field, you realize again, how much more complicated that is, but there's this striving for simplicity coupled perhaps with this reduction, reductionistic mindset and maybe a will for control that, that makes science appear as that kind of science. So in, in that respect, I wanted to go to the following place. So this is called the future scientist, but we often hear in the media a, a statement and then comma science says, but it's not often, I mean, science, there's no science with capital S. There are many types of sciences. And also you were talking about the experts, which is a fascinating topic. I, was ex I wasn't expecting to come across talking to you because it, expert has to do with having experience with the matter, right? Concrete. Um, experience with it. And so there's some kind of experts and then there are other kind of experts and but some are suppressed and the others are, are presented as the only voice of science. Now, this is at the level of the individual, but I was also wondering about Indian science, if there's something as such, because maybe these, there's, there should be a process of decolonization of thought of this way of practicing science as if it was the only way of practicing science, especially because places like India you have your own worldview, which, which very naturally includes these holistic principles, right? So what's the yeah. status of other ways of practicing science um, that are not typically Western? Very interesting question. It's partly related to my own evolution because I did my PhD and I had an option of continuing to work in a physics institute uh, and I had, you know, two options in job, jobs to be to continue on what I had done or solve a puzzle that was really troubling me that we are always told the more science there is, the less poverty there is. But we have we are the third largest scientific community and our poverty keeps growing. So where is the disconnect? And so I joined the science technology um, um, division of a leading management institute in Bangalore, Indian Institute of Management, and dedicated my life for three years to go into those questions, but, you know, but with fishing, with forestry, uh, with the uh, eucalyptus, I, you know, suddenly there was a eucalyptus being planted all over. And I said, since when did this become our species? So I, we started to go deeper into the roots. And that's when I started to also go into the roots of where do these paradigms come from? because you know, we are very privileged in quantum ex uh, exploration that you're not stuck with that mechanistic baggage. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You kind of, you, you've leapfrogged it and, and gone beyond it. And it's during that time I met, I, because we were looking, a brilliant man, a Gandhian, his name is Dharampal and we are celebrating his, his uh, centennial, you know, today would be, he'd have been hundred years old. Uh, so he wrote, he wrote about five very, very important books. He was Gandhi's secretary, but then he got married to a Britisher, so he moved to England. And while there, he started to read and copy because there were no photocopying machines that time. There was no, nothing, yeah? So he used to copy by hand every record of the India Office Library, every record of the Royal Society of England. And he wrote a book that is absolutely seminal. It's called Science and Technology in India in the 18th century. Very mm -hmm. important book. Mm -hmm. And he shows how we were the leading steel makers of that time. 18th century is not that long ago. Yeah. Uh, the, the top, um, we, we used to have vaccination, variolation, smallpox, and 99.9% .9 prevention through the indigenous system. It was studied, taken, and then the indigenous system was banned. Mm -hmm. Steel making was banned. Ship making was banned. Everything that India had mastered, not by having giant factories, 
but by having sophistication of knowing your material, you know, doing, being able to work with metals. I mean, look, look at our, our sculptures. Look at the fact that we have this, uh, you know, this pillar, the Ashoka pillar, thousands of years old, not rusted, yeah? So all of that knowledge was taken, made illegal, and then discounted. And so I have been informed a lot by the fact that because there has been an hierarchy created of knowledges, those who don't really know take where there is knowledge and through colonialism appropriate it, call mm -hmm. it their invention. They were doing it 200 years ago and they're still doing it with the, uh, the phenomenon that I have named biopiracy. I have a book on it. I have fought legal cases on this. We have a beautiful tree called the Neem that as a director indica patented it. First, they said it's a superstition that it can control pests. And then they took a patent on it. Mm -hmm. um, the Basmati, I'm, our valley is very famous for the Basmati aromatic rice. American company in Texas patented it. Um, ancient wheats don't cause gluten allergy. Indian wheats was patented by Monsanto. We fought all of these cases. So I realized that when you create an epistemic hierarchy and an epistemic apartheid, you know, mm. just like the apartheid of Africa was, you're black, we are white, we are superior, we'll rule over you. But the same thing applied to knowledge becomes an epistemic apartheid. And it has not just denied so much of Indian knowledge and such rich knowledge. You know, when I read Schrodinger and then I come to the roots, so where did he really start to figure out well, through Indian philosophy, you know, mm. uh, in Trieste, you know, what is cited there? Um, Fritz of Capra's book on the Vedic dance. So that very deep, I, I believe the two, three qualities of Indian knowledge systems. Number one, no hierarchy. Number two, all, la, all living systems are intelligent systems, mm. and therefore you must know them in their intelligence. And the third, do no harm. That the absence of harm is the sophistication of knowledge. On the other hand, with the Baconian paradigm, the violence of harm is the proof of your power. And so thinking about the indigenous and the idea of local, you, you made me realize that, I mean, Coming from physics, we're taught very early on, which our minds are shaped for this idea of universality, unification, like which which we, we can take in a rather holistic and ecological way, like everything belongs to something greater and so on. But th that can also do something pernicious, which is that it can take what's properly local and just smear it out. Um, it can take um, this knowledge, this window, wisdom, and banned or dilute, diluted, right? So, so it feels to me every time there's an opportunity for some, and the examples you're putting are very telling. Uh, the, these methods have been invented, but then they are acquired by the system, and the, the virtue is taken out of it, and they used again within the mechanistic frame of mind. So, how does one do this sort of epistemic activism? Because um, res resisting, yes, and then seeking for change. I'm not a cynic, but sometimes I am. So I'm really, I'm really um, um, amazed to see that despite, uh, and that's you see, I'm gonna use the word despite, just that despite these many many years you've been fighting, you you're still full of energy and hopeful and and even positive. I tend to be more negative. So where's the good balance between pessimism and optimism when it comes to activism? Well, I think activism can only have optimism. It can have pessimism in terms of a mental projection mm. of the violent system being un unfolding unchecked. Mm. You know, the pessimism is if we keep burning fossil fuels, if we keep leading energy intensive lifestyles, uh, pollution intensive lifestyles, we will make a mess of the planet, not just in terms of climate change, but in terms of biodiversity loss, in terms of the disease pandemics, all of this will just get worse. It already is bad, it'll get worse. For that, we need a quality of pessimism to know how serious the consequences are. And that awareness of pessimism 
then creates the, the responsibility to act for optimism. And optimism then means shaping another path. And, and the question you asked about you know, unity and uniformity and universalization, I see unity as anything where integrity of relationships between diverse systems is maintained, yeah? So unity and diversity go hand in hand. Uniformity in position goes hand in hand by destroying diversity as well as disrupting unity. You know, that mechanistic domination has to destroy the relationships between the soil and the plants, between what we eat and our health. But because of what I call epistemic apartheid, you are working, you're living at the world, looking at the world from your very narrow perspective, and you really have a frog, I view, you know, you're in a frog, you're for a frog in the well. But you as a frog in the well are living in the illusion that the well is the universe. Mm -hmm. And you as a frog are the Mr. Know All. And then you get the imposition of false universalization. I'll give you just two examples that are making a total mess of the world right now. <clears throat> Most of the world eats plants. Some people eat meat. People in the Arctic, Eskimos will have to eat fish because there is no plant that will grow in that snow. In the Amazon, people will, and in forests, people will live with wild animals. And I have watched tribes take an apology. You know, they, they, first of all, they ask the deer, tell us which one we should eat today. They take permission. They don't just shoot in an adequate way. And just like a tiger doesn't take a deer and keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating, no, a tiger knows when to stop. Indigenous people know when to stop. The problem with the greed machine is it doesn't know when to stop because it measures its performance in terms of the money. You know, it forgets, even though we call it materialist, it forgets the material cost. It just forgets how much this extraction is meaningful. And so there is a mess because the system over 10, 15 years created a system of taking animals and putting them into prisons and feeding them human food, yeah, beans and corn and soya. Till then, family, animals were herbivores and they grazed. Out of the blue, you get factory farms. All the science I see now about why we must eat fake food made in labs is out of that very small view of animals can only be in factory farms. And I tell so many of the young people who come and study with us at our Earth University, no, most of the places, animals are part of family. You know, where I'm sitting, this, my mother gave me this building when I said, I'd like to work in deeper service to the earth and communities. And yes, I can continue to have a job, but it does restrict you. And she said, don't worry, chuck your job, take the cow shed. This used to be my mother's cow shed. And my mother used to spend more time with the cows. You know, she knew them as people. We got the leftovers. So I have never had a relationship problem with cows, but those who only seen factory farming have a huge problem. And they are, they don't understand. They're now giving recipes of killing cows. I just saw Ireland has decided for its carbon neutrality. And I know how killing cows can be carbon neutral, but one million sheep and cows will be killed. And this is the recipe, annihilate the animals, annihilate other sentient beings. So this is a false universalization, yeah? Uh, another false universalization is the huge amount of energy use in the West, in the industrial West. Um, I know even Spain and Italy are very different from America on this, that you assume you have to use so much and waste so much energy. And then you take it as the only way to be. Yeah. And then you create panic in the world. Because others have lived with different kinds of energy, but you don't want to see it. So false universalisms can be very violent when they're imposed on different systems that are different economically, different epistemologically, and different biologically and economically. Mm -hmm. So 
the world is not uniform. The world is biologically diverse. The world is culturally diverse. The world is economically diverse. The world is politically very diverse. And diversity is understanding diversity, respecting diversity is a precondition of unity. And, and that, I suppose, needs to be forced into the political system so that there are, there are laws for it at some point, right? So there's perhaps the individual sensitivity and then some sort of an activist group. But then can you tell us about your experience, which is large and it had, there are many examples of foundations and organizations that you've, um, you participate on or you've created perhaps, where that process from the sensibility of a few individuals into an organization, which is like an extended body that then needs to go I suppose, and play a game um, at the level of political yeah. legislations. And then societal so, change, I suppose, yeah. that happens so at the I, same time. So, you know, if we go back to the years of the wars, we go back to the years of Hitler, it was a period where one man could decide other human beings were inferior and could just gas them to death. And the entire human rights came out of that. The Nuremberg Convention came out of that. The UN system came out of that. And we, all of us created constitutions, you know, that respected diversity. We have a very powerful, very strong constitution in India that recognizes that we have different religions and all of them have an equal status. And you cannot have a privileged religion or state religion. We, I have written laws on the biodiversity richness of this country to protect it. I've written laws about the rights of indigenous people, the tribal rights, the forest rights. Um, and these are all legal systems that are meant to protect. But we are going through three levels of dismantling of everything that has been put in place, yeah? So it isn't that we haven't tried that before, you know, the sensibilities of people put into state policy, put into state constitution. The first is globalization, where we started our discussion. Globalization is nothing but deregulation, dismantle what exists mm. for the benefit of a few. And for those, if you're puzzled, how are a few billionaires so rich, you know? How is one Elon Musk so powerful he can buy out Twitter? How is one man, Amazon, so powerful that you could destroy all publishers? And now he runs the biggest iCloud to service all the servicing of all systems. Uh, where did Amazon? You know, you, you want to buy a hairpin, you go to Amazon now. <laughs> you know, you, you want to buy a shoe, you go to Amazon. Where did that part come from? It comes from, how did Mr. Microsoft become so rich? I've watched this because I've watched and study globalization. The first WTO ministerial, Mr. Microsoft made sure that a clause will put that transfer of information, digital information would not be taxed. And that's how they could put people in India to do lower cost software for them. Mm. And they could sell in IT all over the world and never be taxed, they became tax free. So they became the, who are today's billionaires and robber barons, the tech guys. Where did that wealth come from? Being tax free, mm -hmm. one. Number two, making everyone use their system. And this was accelerated even more during COVID. 1.5 trillion additional dollars they made where everyone lost jobs, homes, food. Even in rich countries, people are standing in queues in soup kitchens. You know, Milan, I have seen photographs. Because overnight, your systems are taken away from you, just so that poor billionaires can have a market. And I think the third very, very important part of it is, just like when the British didn't want to leave India, and we were having a very strong freedom movement, and we had said, quit India to the British. They then came up with the philosophy that is work put to work all the time, the divide and rule policy. And they divided Hindus and Muslims. And it's a problem that is constantly resurrected all the time in new divide and rule. But just look at what's going on in France. Yeah, this total polarization. Um, 
and everywhere you have this new levels of divide and rule. So people are more preoccupied with the hate of the other than their lives. You know, the first concern for citizens has become how much can I hate someone else? Mm. Yeah. And this politics of hate is filling the vacuum of the security of diversity in unity. Mm. And, and that's why we have to be, you know, because that's the place at which is being hit is this, is this national governments where the attack is coming big. That's why the subnational will have to be a big player. And I advise the, the C40, the citizen, you know, the, the mayor's associations. I advise many mayors because that's where they are creating the space to make the shift. And then of course, individuals are making a shift during COVID while Mr. Gates was busy trying to save, I'll force everyone to eat fake food. People were growing more food and we had growing more gardens than ever before. Mm. So both the trends are there. And, uh, and we know you know, that earlier question when you asked about optimism, I'll come back to it because it's related to so much of the fact that, you know, in, in India, and I think in any deep spiritual tradition, we realize that your duty is the right action, you know? Not a universally determined right action, but the personally determined through the relationships that you have. Therefore, the word we have for this is called swadharma, you know? With all the relationships that you have, what is the right thing for you to do? And then we know we have a relationship with the earth, what's the right thing for the earth? And that's, you know, that's what's guided me forest protection, seed saving, organic farming, that's what has constantly guided me. But the second part that has to go with it is that's where giving up uncertain, giving up certainty becomes so important that I don't know the outcome because that outcome is in forces beyond me. You know, yeah. my action is in my hands. Yeah. But what happens in the world to my action and its consequences is beyond my hands. So mm. The quality of a deep commitment and deep engagement that comes from a deep compassion and a deep love for life with a deep detachment to the results and the consequences. Mm. And, you know, if, you know, if you say, you know, why haven't I aged at 70? Because I've not brought my ego baggage to the work. Oh, that's so enlightening and helpful because it really sounds like a very important key to this struggle right um giving up certainty and and you were mentioning this quality and i, I actually wanted to ask you about the appropriate the appropriateness or effective tone in 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 this well in this process whether it's fighting certain uh, companies or just trying to steer science towards another direction and so i wanted if you could say something about non-violence and also about ecofeminism. I mean, these are concepts, but I think especially the second one, um, because I must admit when, when I read um, being, a, being a man, but I also think we have, of course, um, feminine aspects in us. And so I would like to see how you see ecofeminism and, and whether one part of the solution is let this feminine aspect that's in everything um, manifest um, and it, it seems to me it's very related to what you were just saying a minute ago. So it's a perfect segue yeah. for me to ask you about those, let's say, words. Yeah. So, you know, Gandhi used to say a daily prayer. Mujhe aur istri mein banao, make me more womanly. Now, wow. He said that with a very deep awareness that over historic time, in indigenous cultures, that's not the case, you know, the compassion is in both, the caring is in both, the babies are looked after both genders, but colonialism and industrialism engineered the genders, yeah? And it decided who will do what. Um, and I'm not saying that patriarchy didn't exist before that, but patriarchy did not exist in the economic domain. In the economic domain, men and women were both engaged in the production and reproduction of life. Mm. Yeah. It's because the industrial colonialism interrupted life, industrialism denied life. Yeah. 
it's, okay. it, now the rule will be of the machine. The rule will be of the fossil. The rule will be of that absolutely fossilized biological matter. And we will now assume that the world is dead. Yeah. Mm. And we will create every category. So much of my scientific work in the last few years has been to deconstruct the categories of the fossil age, productivity, efficiency, yield, mm. growth, because the minute you see them, in the narrow defines of ex extractivism, they seem to make total sense. You embed them in living systems, they look nonsensical. So for me, ecofeminism is a simple recognition that violence as associated with a particular masculinity is a social construct. Mm -hmm. Women being denied any creativity is a social construct. Nature being denied, creativity, intelligence, is a scientific, social scientific construct. So what is the science of the future? Realizing that nature is alive and intelligent and living systems are cognitive. That's your work, Alex. Mm. Yeah? That living systems have cognition. Yeah. Now, that is the part that is the big breakthrough now. But women are leading the way everywhere. Yeah. Partly because the greed has crossed all boundaries. You know, people talk about planetary boundaries, you know, they draw a graph and then say, oh, the biodiversity is going and the nitrogen is accessing it. But the real planetary boundary we are violating is the limits of human action, yeah? And women have had to recognize those limits because they were always pushed to the margins. Mm. And being pushed, the marginalization yes. of women is their relevance at this moment, where we have to transcend the hierarchies and the violence and the domination. Mm. So the non-violence then goes hand in hand with knowing, you know, I, I've got my lovely Annapurna behind me. She has six hands. Yeah. Now, in any system of presenting food, you will never see six hands. You will never see the sugar cane and the banana and the rice because these are all for crops that were originated in India. You will never have to see her holding it all and giving it in abundance. So mm -hmm. the non-violence is recognizing mm -hmm. to not do harm to the earth, is recognizing that other beings have a right, other humans have potential, and ecofeminism for me, also means men being able to get rid, like women getting rid of, of the blinkers that say, you don't know, you don't have knowledge, you don't work, saying, but I work, I'm creative, I have knowledge. And for the men to remove the blinkers, that to be a man, you have to be violent. Yeah? To be a man, you can be womanly, as Gandhi said. Thank you again for that. So in, in, in wrapping up so that there's time for, for questions and comments. So wh what are the areas of scientific research that you see today with greater projection or potential to enact all these ideas and changes that are already underway? Quantum mechanics, we mentioned quantum mechanics, which, which is a paradigmatic one, right? Um, but what other areas of biology, even psychology, and even philosophy, because as you were talking about the, this, this conceptual work of deconstructing, deconstructing the categories, there, ha there has to be a lot of philosophical work there as well. Well, I definitely feel we'll have to transcend the mechanistic philosophy, mm. which was not, you know, I mean, it, it was never part of the philosophy of the Renaissance. The Renaissance had a much deeper intimate relationship with nature, whether you look at Michelangelo or you look at Leonardo da Vinci, you know, the lovely book by my friend um, um, Fritz of Capra on the science of Leonardo, yeah, mm. that it was not the reductionist enlightenment science of superiority of human beings over other life. Um, so we'll have to give up mechanistic philosophy. We will have to give up anthropocentric mm. philosophy. And that's why I've never agreed with friends in the environment community who use the term Anthropocene. Mm. I said just because some men for a short 100 years could mess up the climate systems of this planet doesn't make them the 
substitutes for the planet as a whole. Mm. You know, the power to destroy is not the power to create. Mm. That's an eco-feminist philosophy, yeah? That the power to destroy and the power to create are very different forms of power. The mm. power to create is a non-violent power of creation. The power to destroy is ignorance. You don't have to know what you're destroying. You just have to have the power to destroy. You just have to take a hammer and just break something. And uh, it's violent. It's violent both epistemologically because you're not understanding what you're doing and you're not understanding the repercussions and you're not taking responsibility for it. And that's why you see all the time the destroyers running away and wanting to turn it into the map. And a very big area of work, of scientific work, will have to be deconstructing the unscientific discourse of the polluters creating offerings of false solutions. I've done two books, the, my book, Oneness versus 1% One and the new book on philanthropic capitalism is if you polluted the atmosphere and that's the problem, how can more pollution through aerosols be a solution? Mm. Which is what Mr. Gates is funding. Or if, if the mess was violence against sentient beings, how can more violent systems mm. be the solution to a food system? Mm. Yeah? How can more fossil fuel use? How can more chemical use? How can more fertilizer use? How can more GMO soya you being used as feedstock for lab food be a solution? So mm. I think the false solutions to climate change, where you know they that's where they come with a capital S and say, because the powerful have decided that this rubbish they can speak, you know, I have right here on my table because this comes up all the time. This would not qualify for science. How to avoid climate catastrophe. It's got two, you know, it's got a page selling synthetic fertilizers. When we know it's, it emits greenhouse gases mm. and he's saying this is the future. Mm. So we have to have the courage to take on the pseudoscience of the power mm. and practice the humility of true science, mm. yeah? And, you know, he, because he's big on this meaty, uh, you know, uh, kill all the animals, destroy all uh, economies, local economies. And he says the problem for methane is not that you put a 100,000 animals in one place and feed them animal feed that wasn't their diet and you mess up their stomachs. No, the problem is cows have four stomachs. Well, if that's the case, we should have had methane forever. We had wild animals, we had more bison in the prairies that, you know, the graph shouldn't have climbed like this. Yeah. So to blame the animal for having four stomachs and say, therefore get rid of them. I think the ability to do independent science, to see the true relationships, you know, I'm giving a talk tomorrow and uh, I'm going to tell people, I said, you know, why don't we just shift? for a while, from the four stories of the three greenhouse has, gases to the gas of life. Let us start telling the story of the planet through oxygen and the whole world will change. Let me dare to ask you a final one. This is really the final one. Uh, it's, it, it's about the evolution of the human being, um, which may sound maybe too speculative, but most of what we're saying sounds to me at least to kind of recover something that was lost in the past or buried or denied. It's, it's an exercise of, in a way, going back to previous moments where those things were um, more harmoniously being expressed. And I recognize that's one part of the task, but do you see in that, because we cannot really go back to the past. So what do you see in terms of the future as, as humanity evolving? In its, in its awareness of its relationship to the earth, even you could say the evolution of consciousness, which are two words that put together maybe freak out people, but is there a trend you see there? It's not just a coming back, is it a trend towards evolving our consciousness or that's not even necessary or possible? No, no, I mean, I think there's a whole issue of a deeper awareness of consciousness and in various ways in which it expresses itself, in which you, are, which you become aware of it. But I am definitely not among those who thinks that the consciousness is in the machine and not in us. Mm. You know, just like anthropocentrism was wrong by saying other beings are less than us. Mm. 
this uh, elate, elevating mechanistic philosophy to the level that you say that uh, what are these people who in Silicon Valley who I call them the Descartes of the digital age, you know, mm. who are so blinded by the mechanistic philosophy that they can't understand the human potential. So uh, when you're talking about going back, I think that's wrong. You know, I don't think going back is anyway an option, but I think making corrections is an option. I think fossil fuel was an error. For those who say you're going back, if you're getting out of destroying all your forests for coal, you know, our tribals are fighting against coal mines. And of course, those who benefit from coal say you're going back. You want to be a tribal. Well, the tribal say, yes, we want to be tribal. We want to live. And I think part of what we have to shed in this period of moving towards the future is we have to give up chrono colonization. Mm. For me, chrono colonization is the powerful deciding what they're going to do with those who are weaker and tell them that's your future. I think every being, if we take consciousness seriously, every being has the option to evolve in their self-organized potential. And that is an obligation we have to leave the space for others. That's not a back or forward, that's an evolution. Thank you so much. And I think this is a great point to pause and, and hear what other people have to say and ask. Thank you so much, Madonna, Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Well, thank you both. Uh, at this point, we can now um, bring in the rest of the group. So if you would like to ask a question to both Alex and Dr. Shiva, please, uh, you can use a raise your hand function. Um, otherwise, you can also put your question in the chat and, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. So you can bring in your voice. I see Alex that there's a question there in the chat. Would you, would you like to? Which, I mean, I haven't been looking at the chat. So I'm just a bit, uh, I'm looking at it now. Moment. Is there any particular one you would want us to? Well, we have Alan with his hand up. Why don't we bring in Alan's voice? All right. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. That's an incredibly um, interesting um, dialogue and thought provoking. Um, I've got really a, a very general question. I've taken an interest in economics and as far as I've got is to really believe that the aim of economic systems should be to create thriving communities. And, but that's far from easy because we do seem to live in a world where people don't stay and live where they're born, but essentially they move to where they think they will, anything from make most money or have the most interesting career or whatever. But I'm still struck that communities to me still seems the fundamental unit or should be the fundamental unit of progress because communities can really understand the place where they find themselves, where they're born, the environment and so forth. And I can even imagine that would create, communities can create the kind of diversity that I think we'd all like to see. So at a certain level, through communities, science can progress and there'll be more diversity. And then at another level, things can come together and people can share their findings. But still the fundamental basis of progress, source of progress, I believe are thriving communities. Could you comment on that? And do you have any ideas how to, if you agree, actually make that um, come about? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we are community. Sometimes we are blind to it. We take it for granted. We don't see it. For example, my philosophy is we are earth community. You know, we wouldn't be breathing without the trees. We wouldn't be drinking water without the watersheds. We wouldn't be eating food without the soil organisms. Yeah. So we are community. And if there's life, there's community. But because we've had these few hundred years of the Cartesian, Maconian, mechanistic thought, 
which was in denial of community with the earth. Then you had the enclosures of the commons, which were a rupture of community life, very violent as the history of England teaches us, uh, and an uprooting. I mean, ev every colonization was a uh, enclosure of the commons, but a breaking of community and globalization about which we talked was the ultimate breaking. I remember I, when I was in the Convention on Biological Diversity and I would talk about community rights because indigenous people don't function as individuals, they function as communities. And you had dear Margaret Thatcher having said, there's nothing like a society, they're only individuals because they were trying to build a consumer society where you had to break community. And in my negotiation with my government at the Convention on Biological Diversity, every time I would raise the issue of community, which for us is a reality, you know, the US negotiator would go red in the face and say there's nothing like community, yeah? Because denying community means you deny rights, but you do something even more important. You appropriate and enclose the commons because the community and the commons hang together. And the community is the unit that allows the care of the commons. The minute you've destroyed community, the commons become private property, yours to extract. And the second part of this denial of community is you then can write nonsense like the tragedy of the commons. Yeah, That the minute something is shared, it will degrade. So let it only be in the hands of someone who will make profits out of it. And, um, and you know, I think Alex will understand. You know, I always see processes and I see processes with vectors, you know? So the issue is not that this much money is being made. The point is, where is that money going? The vector decides. And in an extractive system which destroys community, everyone is prevented from being a creator and producer to becoming a consumer. And if you're looking around in the world and seeing where the billionaires want to take us, they, they want a world where most people won't have anything. Yeah, Look at the rate of homelessness being created in rich countries. I talked about hunger before. And that basically means earlier you had a welfare state that took care of you. The welfare state has stepped out. And the billionaires are stepping forward and saying, oh, we'll make more money out of privatization. And they know nobody's telling them how. I mean, please read my essay on Mother Earth Day. And I've just written a simple thing because we did the WTO work and we said our world is not for sale. Our seeds are not for sale. They're not your patented property. Our water's not for sale. It's not your commodity. So now I said our Mother Earth is not for sale because the financial world and the billionaires have decided all of nature will belong to them. There'll be no communities and they'll sell everything. They'll trade in everything. And they worked out a 4,000 4, trillion economy out of trading in stocks and assets of the, on the real world of rivers and forests and oxygen and water. So we are at a, you know, I think these next few years will be very important. Will we be able to form community and hang together to create what I call the infrastructure of life, yeah? to provide for each other, care for the earth, because it will be absolutely necessary. If we don't, I can tell you half of humanity won't have food, won't have shelter, and we don't know what kind of violence this will lead to, or, and what kind of militarism mm. to prevent the violence this will lead to. If I look at the streets of what's happening in France, you know, it, it's sad because 10 years ago, the unions could fight for their rights. France had the most organized unions. And with the deregulation that's growing so fast, they're losing things. So they're fighting, but it's becoming a polarized fight and it's going to be very, very violent. It's going to be very violent. So totally agree with you, Alan. Thank Where you. communities are there, defend them. Where communities aren't there, form them. We learn, we learn how to read and write. We learn boring stuff that we don't need in life. Let's start to learn how to, I think we need schools for community. Thank you very much for that brilliant answer. Thank you.
Richard, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Richard here, I'm from Calgary in Alberta, Canada. And I first uh, heard you, met you in 1998 at the Gandhi conference. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> hello. hello, and yeah. I, uh, I spent time at the Tata Institute in the 90s and I have had a student in Kerala co-ops or structures in around the same time. What I'm is currently the question? working with a, a, uh, a group and we're trying to change the perspective of the social work discipline that has been trapped into the notion of self-determination rather than co-determination is still important. And they're still trapped in the idea of solidarity in the old platonic sense instead of network or, or community. Um, have you some th thoughts on how even taking forward this ideas that you were expressing so uh, well today uh, um, to speak to a, a smaller a part of the world that thinks it's holistic and thinks it's uh, for the yeah. social good. I, I think for every every discipline right now, we need to see how much in flux they are. Yeah, we need to watch every day how systems that weren't perfect, but were at least giving people um, some protection. I mean, I studied, I did my PhD in Canada, and then I did it because Jeff Wu, uh, Boom student was there and it, there was a colloquium in quantum theory where every, every scientist who was doing foundations of quantum theory had been attracted by the government of Canada. But it was a Canada where no one needed anything. You know, everyone had homes, everyone had jobs, healthcare was a public good. And I've seen images of people being thrown out of homes and being thrown in streets. And then the RMP, you call it, right? The Royal Military Police or whatever they call it, going <laughs> and tearing down the tents of the homeless in the parks in Toronto, in Windsor. And so, I uh, yes, we need to make a shift in terms of the social protection systems. But I think the disappearance of social protection is equally important. And this is where I always bring my philosophy of diversity. People, you know, say, oh, the state must do it or others say the people must do it. Or some others say, oh, neither state, no people, just let some world government do it. I think we've got to realize that people have responsibility and rights and as community, they have power. And that's where the earlier question comes in, that we have to go out of this mechanistic poor, poor thing and help them into these are people with potential. And how is it that we can go create a future that works for all in the most dismal and brutal of circumstances, you know, without being, de without denying how violent the world in which we are, how to continue to act with love and compassion and hope. That's our challenge. Thank you. Carlos. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for your words and for your examples. Uh, I have a question. How free science may prevail when education is becoming a business? <laughs> um, I think how free science will prevail when education is a business, we will have to create new places, new learning centers. You know, uh, with next to nothing, I have created the Research Foundation but then I've created an Earth University. And at the Earth University, we do a lot of research. We do a lot of foundational research. We have offer a lot of courses and people come. So we have to become innovative. You know, it's like when the church was ruling, the scholastics were the only voice of science of that time. And then new systems were created. Now those systems are crumbling as knowledge, you know, Money cannot run a knowledge system. It can run a profit-making system, but it cannot run a seeking, you know, a knowledge seeking. Knowledge seeking is a thirst. It comes from within. It's a hunger for knowing deeper. 
and the flow of the goodness out of it comes because of the purity of the action. So we have to create new spaces. And the one thing I've learned from Gandhi and my society is this mind, you know, I, I was hugely attacked when I took on Monsanto and, you know, and they used everything. They used everything to try and attack me. And, you know, so and the media would come and say, so who pays you? I said, this brain doesn't need to work for anybody. It doesn't need a salary. It's part of being. And thinking is part of a free person and a free mind. So let us use whatever possibilities we have, where we have enough to do a lab, like Alex's, do that. Where that's not possible, let's do the science with the earth. She doesn't demand a piece, yeah? Where we work with community, with so little we can work. If I learned one thing over these 50 years, is you can do a lot with a little, as long as you have generosity of heart. Un abrazo, Carlos. Alex, Carlos Alex is, do you want to come in? Well, I wanted to say hi to Carlos because he's a friend of mine and I wasn't expecting to see him here. So thank you for your question. And at the same time, I was thinking that you, Carlos, and I are somewhat in the trenches within the system. Where I am not creating, well, maybe the Future Scientist Initiative is something like that, but I still see myself, and I'm going to say it's recorded and would be public, but a kind of a Trojan horse in a way. So I'm trying to do this work from within. And um, well, I guess all creative um, options, as, as Vandana was saying, uh, are needed, right? Create things outside oh, and absolutely. try to resist inside and maybe change, well, some minds and my own too, but within, I I'm trying to do a lot of work so far within, within the system. And, and we need that too, Alex, because, you know, when, when I understood how wrong to not have impact assessment of genetic modification was, and what we were saying is assess the impact. That's all we were saying, assess the impact. And the corporations wanted no assessment, you yeah? know? And they, of course, named us anti-GMO, anti-this, anti-that, et cetera. But so much of the work we then did, you know, I went to my scientist friend and, there's, I, and I said, Here's the system I see. Here are the basic relationships I understand. But I don't have the facility to work in the detail like you do in your labs. And that's how we built this strong new scientific movement. You know? And it created new, new understanding of, of gene ecology, you know? how genes interact. And I feel very happy that we had friends who had labs who could do this. And, you know, if again, coming back to the quantum humility, no excluded middle. Mm -hmm. We don't need excluded middles. We need porous boundaries. Yeah. But, uh, money doesn't believe in that, unfortunately. No, no, money doesn't. And that's why we have to try. If you read my essay, it's in the Navdanya International website, Mother Earth is not for sale. I've talked about how currency basically meant that which flows. Now that which flows is what makes life, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's only with the East India Company in 1610, invest, no, currency was reduced to money and invest was reduced to making money out of money. So our minds have shrunk to only being, being controlled by money and seeing the world through money. And we have to, you know, I think this is the future scientist, if you ask me, a scientist who can see all the flows and understand their richness, a scientist who can understand all the currencies and understand the different forms of intelligences that are at work. That diversity in the monocultures that money has created, that is where the new openings are being created and will be created. Let's hope so. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Fruind? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for 
what I feel is very close to my heart. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, you are completely right that today uh, the science is very much shaped by uh, as being a mental exercise. And uh, we do have also other kinds of intelligences like emotional intelligence. And uh, this is very much uh, underestimated right now. I'm a German scientist, but I have been living in France for uh, 40 years. So I'm an old guy, so I don't know what will be the future scientist. <laughs> but I'm still, you know, my scientific approach has evolved in the sense that you cannot separate the how from the who. That means that, uh, you know, that there's the same letters, you know, how and who. So what is your opinion about uh, um, going beyond the purely mental exercise and doing another, another kind of exploration that adds the deontology to the, uh, to the uh, way we, uh, we do science and how we use the results yeah. of science and where we are going to aim science. And, so, and what, would you, what would you say uh, as essential words to the young people who are starting their career and who are really trying to publish or perish rather than to look into themselves and to have an inside out approach. Um, you know, as we've discussed throughout the evening, even in the mental level, mechanistic reductionism shrunk even the mental process yeah in into not just an analytic process but a a, a reductionist analytic protest process so first of all we have to widen the mental itself we have to widen the mental into understanding systems as wholes understanding relationships you know because that was all sacrificed and i think a big part of which will have to be being awake to the multiple intelligences in human potential as well as in life. You know, there's so much discipline now on the brilliance of the soil, you know, that it's a neuro neurological system. Well, our farmers always said that, you know, but now there are ways of me me measuring. Um, the gut, Ayurveda always said, the gut is where health begins. So therefore your food is where health begins and food is where disease begins. In the last 10 years, scientists have started to see the gut microbiome as a key part and therefore food as a key part. And the top cancer specialists and all are moving to organic farming because they have realized that through their relationship. So for the young people, what I would say is never get trapped in publish or perish. You know, no matter, uh, never let that be your prison because if you've chosen to, to seek knowledge and do science, you will not be able to walk that path with all it has to offer. If you put the publishing and perishing on top of it, yeah? Because there you're working on a market thing. And now that there are so many open source publication systems, there's so much new ways, you know, given that, the dominant system wants money for you to publish your paper, yeah? And then they can take the top scientists and get their papers removed because the Monsanto said, oh my God, how can, you're in France, I mean, how can Eric Serralini's paper show that GMO soy and uh, GMO corn caused uh, vital organ problems and caused uh, um, tumors? Well, the, eventually the WHO had to accept it and a thousand, I don't know, two. 150,000 cases are being fought in America on the basis of Seralini's work. Though, of course, you know, my Wikipedia page, Seralini's page is the Seralini affair, that shady creature. So we know, you know, not only is that, I see things as three levels. There's a non-science of the corporate world, which is propaganda. Speak nonsense, just have it published everywhere and it'll all look all good. Then there is the narrow-minded science, which is reductionist. And then there's the open world, open heart science. 
And that is where you have to have deep confidence in yourself as a scientist to engage in it. And that's when you realize you're living in a living world. And you know, coming back, Alex, to your, you know, what is the future scientist? And you talked about back and forth and up, upstairs and downstairs and all these dimensions. You know, quite simple. Future science will have to be a science of staying alive with other beings that whose lives has to be respected. If we can achieve that, we are good scientists. Thank you. Can we can we take one more question? How do you both feel? The last it? one. The last one. The last one. That. Okay, Pam, please do come in. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you so much, Alex and um, Dr. Shiva, for this amazing, beautiful discussion. I'm not a scientist. I'm an artist. And I just will end this because I'm sure you don't want to talk too long. But the idea of reciprocal maintenance seems to me really important if we're going to live in some kind of harmonious balance with the earth again, because at the moment, everything is so wildly mad that unless we go back to some kind of simple, harmonious understanding of what we are in relation to the earth and other sentient beings, then I cannot see how we can possibly succeed. Perhaps you just comment on that for me, because that's what I'm working on. Sure. Well, and you, you know, when, when you say you you're a my mind. <laughs> I, I say, you know, for me, a good scientist is a scientist who sees patterns. Oh, yeah, I see and patterns. See, that's all. And seeing patterns is an, a work of art. Thank you. <laughs> you might go into detail in terms of elaborating that pattern yes. with a language that is not art. But patterns is what makes good science. Yeah? Recognizing patterns is what makes good science. And patterns is relationships. And when you talk about harmony, you see, I am, I've learned now, I've learned less from books because I haven't studied these fields and more from living with other beings on the farm and growing with them and, and seeing their amazing phenomenal performances. Uh, you know, it's, it's like an orchestra, you know, I'm, I'm like a symphony all the time. I've learned three things. One, Every being is self-organized. You know, the smallest seed knows what to do with itself. Perfect. Yeah, it's not inert, it's not dead. Number two, every being is in symbiotic relationship with other beings. And what they're giving is gifts. And with gifts, they're receiving other gifts. Not in a transactional thing, you know, but in like the mycorrhizal fungi comes and just gives to the plant. And the plant is feeding the fungi, but both are giving gifts. They're not saying, oh, how much did you give me? You know, right. and how much is it worth? Because mm -hmm. they're not stuck in that petty accounting. They are engaging in giving. Mm -hmm. And the third quality is living systems know how to heal because there are disruptions, but there's always a coming back to the homeostasis. And that's where healing takes place. Now, those are three observable phenomena in nature. There are scientists who go deep into it. For me, it's more observation and enough intelligence to guide my action. Mm -hmm. People like Alex are working to go much deeper into these linkages. But out of that comes respect for the earth and out of that comes an obligation to care for the earth. And from that comes from me, the quiet non-violent resistance to say don't do harm don't yeah it's so unnecessary and there are times where it doesn't you know no one listens and there are other times that people listen but ultimately you're talking to your conscience from your conscience and therefore you cannot silence your conscience thank you amazing but thank you greetings much. to everyone <laughs> Thank you. Lovely meeting all of you. Thank you, Vandana, for your honest and lucid and really vitalizing example. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Good night. Good night from me. <laughs>
Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and presence, every one of you. Thank you. And thank you, Alex. Thank you for inviting Dr. Shiva, and thank you for curating this incredibly important series. So I just want to thank you for everything that you're doing. And um, with that, uh, we can announce that the next session in this series will be on May 11th. And Alex will be in conversation with John Horgan, who's an award-winning science journalist. So I will put the link in the chat for everybody. Um, and uh, please have a look at that. And, and we'd love to see you at the next session. And thank you all for being here today.